Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Event Horizon, African Philosophy of Time. If you were able to visit the distant past, you'd be struck by many obvious differences. There would be the lack of indoor plumbing, the difficulty of traveling long distances, the tragedy of cute things done by pets that are witnessed only by their owners rather than by a global audience of social media users. A more subtle but even more far-reaching difference would lie in the way that peoples of the past experienced time. Without the technologies that enable exact timekeeping, it would have been impossible to do things like making an appointment for 3.30 p.m. sharp. The temporal measurements used in everyday life would have been larger, one would think in days rather than minutes. Even where the same measurements were used, these would have different meanings. Many pre-modern societies divided the time of daylight into a certain number of hours, but the length of the hours would vary through the year, because the sun is up for longer in summer than in winter. That is something we already see with the ancient Egyptians, who can be credited with devising much of the time system we still use today. They had an annual calendar with 365 days, each of which was split into 24 hours, with 12 hours each for daytime and nighttime. They were also pioneers in timekeeping technology, devising such things as sundials and water clocks, which were then also used by the Greeks and Romans. Nonetheless, the Egyptians seem to have conceptualized time very differently than we do. Nowadays, time is often imagined as a kind of indefinitely extending line, with seconds, days, and years marking off smaller and larger sections of the line. For the Egyptians, as for the Indians and some Greek philosophers, like the Stoics, it seems instead to have been cyclical. This, despite the fact that time was also believed to be the creation of the gods. A hymn to the goddess Neith praises her in the following terms, She made the moment, she created the hours, she made the years, she created the months, she gave birth to the season of inundation, to winter, to summer. This act of creation comes at the beginning of a cosmic cycle. During each cycle, the paramount concern is to preserve order and stability, which is especially threatened at moments of temporal transition, like at the start of a new year, or the passing of day into night. At least going by the texts we have, which were of course produced by the elite, the priests and rulers had the special task of warding off such chaos. Other humans were simply to carry out the social roles that had always existed. Thus, it has been said that the Egyptians had very little sense of history or even of past and future. They thought of the world as essentially static and unchanging, and that the linear character of time scarcely seems to have exceeded the domain of individual existence. The language used by the Egyptians may reflect this. Their words, jet and nene, hard if not impossible to translate into English, refer to the temporal aspect of reality as a whole. But Nene, associated with the sun god Re, and the emergence of the new day, had connotations of change, while Diet was connected with Osiris and the night, and implies that something is already completed. One can thus say that Nene comes while Diet endures. Once we notice how differently even the Egyptians perceived time, despite their clocks and calendars, we might wonder what time has been like for other peoples who lacked those technologies and also had no writing. The written word is, after all, another technology, which brings with it the power to record what has happened even many years ago. Thus, it has been remarked that literacy brings an awareness of the past as different from the present. A people with no writing would, we might expect, have even less sense of history than the Egyptians, and even less sense of time as an abstract continuum or vessel that can be divided into segments or in which events can be located. That is the hypothesis we will be exploring in this episode, as we look at attempts to discover and articulate ideas of time held in traditional African societies. It's a topic that has been attracting interest for many decades. A pioneering study by the British anthropologist Edward Evans Pritchard, published in 1939, looked at the time reckoning of the Nuer people who lived near one of the Nile's tributaries in what is today South Sudan. He reports that the Nuer spoke of time in a very concrete fashion, dividing it up in terms of seasonal cycles, especially the wet and dry seasons, and with reference to social events. On a daily basis, 
This meant speaking of parts of the day in terms of the tasks to be performed, like taking out the cattle. Over longer periods, the Nua were, according to Evans Pritchard, hardly able to conceive of a past stretching back more than a few generations, basically as far as a given person knows his or her own lineage of ancestors. Furthermore, their language has no word for time as such. Thus, in his words, the Nuer cannot, as we can, speak of time as though it were something actual, which passes, can be wasted, can be saved, and so forth. Similar conclusions were reached by anthropological studies of other groups, such as the Tiv of Nigeria and the Kagaru, a Bantu people from Tanzania. In both cases, it was found that time was considered in the concrete terms of events, and usually only in the context of relating events to one another, as when a pregnancy is measured by full moons. The Kagaru word for day is actually the same as their word for sun, and like the Nuer, their understanding of years is completely determined by seasonal rainfall. The anthropologists tried to discover whether these Africans had a largely unspoken concept of more abstract time, and concluded that they did not. One researcher found that the Tiv, despite being well aware of lunar cycles and of seasons, were making no attempt to coordinate the two. When this anthropologist says in his study, I have asked specifically and exhaustively about this point, one can't help wondering whether the Tiv were even more bemused by him than vice versa. We are told that while the Tiv have folk tales, which they tell about the past, they have no real sense of history. Anything further back than the recent past resides in a kind of hazy period called long ago, which is how their stories begin, like our once upon a time. For the Kagaru we read, time is essentially a vague sliding scale focused on the near present in which the past and future are of relatively little concern, so that they do not reify time in the western sense, in which it sometimes seems to take on the attributes of a substance or a commodity. Which actually sounds pretty good, right? Isn't it pretty stressful to believe that time is money? That it is a scarce resource that we must use with maximal efficiency? Arguably, this attitude emerged in Europe precisely along with early modern advancements, if they were really advancements, in keeping track of time, like in the ringing of church bells to signal that it was time for mass or to go off to work. Thus, we have the wife of an Italian merchant admonishing him by letter in 1399, I deem nothing so precious to you, both for body and soul, as time, and think you value it too little. Of course, we might doubt whether the methods used by these anthropologists, whose fieldwork was done in the 1930s and 1950s, were really a foolproof method of discovering African notions of time. But to some extent, their findings have been borne out by subsequent research, for instance, into African proverbs. Thus, a much more recent study from the 1990s looked at the sayings of the Ga and Dangme, two ethnic groups from Ghana. They do have a word for time, namely be, but it has been argued that for them, to talk of time is to talk of some event or activity. They are keenly aware of the way that things arise and then pass, as captured in their saying, no kite has ever remained in the air. The vital thing, though, is to act at the right time. Thus, they say, a mother does not wait in the market until the last person leaves, and you don't haggle of the price of a yam that is still in the ground. It may be that a grasp of time as inextricably linked to concrete events goes together with the idea that events are repeating, or at least that the future will be more or less like the past. Thus we have the entertaining proverb, when the old woman goes to fetch water, she will return. The issue is when she'll get back. And among the Yoruba, if a father has begotten a child, however long it might take, the child may yet beget the father. If a mother gave birth to a child, she can still be reborn by the child. The most influential attempt to extract a theory of time from this sort of material was put forward by the Kenyan philosopher John Mbiti. His groundbreaking book, African Religions and Philosophy, first published in 1969, drew on observations concerning traditional African societies in Kenya, such as the Akamba and Gikuyu, both of whom speak Bantu languages. An Anglican priest, Mbiti was struck by what he saw as a mismatch between the understanding that Christian missionaries had of their own religion and the worldview of the Africans those missionaries sought to instruct. The Protestant tradition, and Christianity more generally, promises a salvation that may lie in the far-flung future. Africans were bound to find this teaching puzzling, if not meaningless, because, as Mbiti put it, 
For them, time is a two-dimensional phenomenon with a long past, a present, and virtually no future. As evidence for this, Mbiti adduced some of the same features of traditional societies highlighted by the anthropological studies we've just mentioned. According to Mbiti, Africans have an exclusively concrete and empirical understanding of time, which is nothing but the sequence of events they have experienced. Their lives are governed by natural phenomena, like the seasons, and they expect these to continue into the future as they have in the past. But beyond that, the future has no meaning. Since it has not been experienced, it does not make sense, it cannot therefore constitute part of time. Mbiti introduces a terminological distinction of his own here, using the Swahili words sasa and zamani. Sasa is the immediate present, or at least ongoing events, up to a maximum duration of about two years. A larger scale and more abstract and almost entirely past kind of time is zamani. It swallows up sasa as events recede into history, so that zamani is, as Mbiti puts it, the graveyard of time. Speaking of graveyards, when people die, they move from sasa into zamani, especially once they are forgotten by those still alive. Confronted with something like the eschatology of the Christian missionaries, these Africans can only conclude that salvation is going to occur very imminently. After all, for them, there is no real future beyond what is imminent. Some scholars have found this to be a powerful and convincing analysis of the traditional African conception of time. A few years after Mbiti, one article noted the resonance between his analysis and the earlier findings of anthropologists like Evans Pritchard. The same author argued that the very division into past, present, and future is due to an abstract notion of time as an entity which is alien to African thought. For Africans, there are not times, but events. More recently, a philosopher we mentioned back in episode 8, Masai Kebede, has argued that the Europeanization of Ethiopia displaced the traditional notion of time as cyclical, which had the advantage that social classes were fluid. When you were a peasant rather than a king, you knew that your family line just needed to wait its turn. It's worth underscoring that such inferences were often drawn from the study of African languages. Mbiti observed, regarding the Bantu languages discussed in his book, that they have a verb modifier to indicate the more distant past, but none for the distant future. Similarly, it was pointed out that in the Kiluba language of southern Zaire, there is a distinction between the present and what is further from the present, with the latter being almost always used for the past. Then came the backlash. Mabiti's account was criticized on a number of grounds, some of which have probably already occurred to you. For one thing, even if we accept his claims concerning the groups he knew best in Kenya, would that show that his findings apply to all Africans prior to their encounter with other cultures? Thus, Ernest Bayaraza, in a book published in 2000, allowed that Mbiti might have been right about the Akamba and Gikuyu peoples, but this was only a caveat at the end of a long discussion about conceptions of time among the Bakisa of Uganda, which comes to strikingly different conclusions from those of Mbiti. Bayaraza speaks of social conventions that obviously require a conception of the distant future. The Bakisa have an arrangement in which a poor man works for years to earn a calf that will be born in coming years, and rituals that look ahead to the prosperity of children once they are grown. Their language includes the sort of indefinite future constructions Mbiti claimed not to find in Bantu, as well as abstract references to time, which is called abwire, days being understood as its parts. An even more forthright critique was made by Kwame Jeche, who found expressions for abstract time in another African people, the Akan. They say that time, bere, is like a bird. If you do not catch it and it flies, you do not see it again. Never mind the future, the Akan even articulate a notion of eternity by speaking of bere santen, meaning times lined up in a row. Their divination practices show that they have a powerful interest in future events, as do sayings like, time has its boundary, we do not traverse it, everything will end in the hereafter someday. Again, a study of time among the Yoruba shows that on closer inspection, their concrete, event-centered, and possibly cyclical approach to time does not rule out the envisioning of long future time spans or dwelling on the unknowability of the future. If these observations suggest that Mbiti was rash in generalizing from one or two groups in Kenya to a pan-African philosophy of time, 
he can also be accused of not generalizing enough. As we suggested at the beginning of this episode, any people of the distant past would surely have had a very different experience of time than we do now. To the extent that Mbiti's points do apply to all of Africa, they might well apply to all societies that lack writing, or even more widely than that. Just consider that in Aristotle, the repetition of natural cycles is far more prominent than anything remotely like Christian eschatology. Making this point, one scholar has remarked that linear time has as little to do with traditional Africa as it had to do with Aristotle. To this, Mbiti would perhaps respond that the linguistic features he has observed among Bantu groups do not necessarily appear in the languages of other peoples with no tradition of writing. But even if his observations are accurate, it is far from obvious that they provide a basis for inferring an implicit philosophy of time. After all, even if you can use English to refer to the remote past and distant future, how often do you talk about anything but the near future, present, and recent past, except, that is, when you were talking about the history of philosophy. There is actually a deep philosophical issue lurking here as to whether features of a language betray specific conceptual worldviews or even cause such worldviews to arise. This idea is often called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis after the two linguists who put it forward. Roughly speaking, it posits that language is something like a lens through which people think about the world and shapes the fundamental concepts through which they engage with that world. As it happens, a famous and much criticized application of the theory was Worf's own contention that one group of Native Americans, the Hopi, must have a different notion of time, because of the way their language supposedly works. And there is more than a whiff of Worf in Mbiti's approach to the African philosophy of time. It seems fair to say that for all these reasons, Mbiti's proposals are no longer seen with much favor. Yet, some of his critics have agreed that traditional African peoples may have something to teach us about time, or at least about the variety of ways that time might be experienced. The Rwandan philosopher Alexis Kagame rejected some of the details of Mabiti's account, for instance by pointing out the importance in Bantu culture of the future success of one's family line. Yet, he still deemed it possible to generalize from a broader study of Bantu language and culture to a properly African idea of time. The evidence he drew on has much in common with those anthropological studies, for example the use of concrete events to name times of day. Rather beautifully, it seems that the Tutsi herdsmen of Rwanda call the start of the day the laughing of dawn and early morning the song of the little birds. Yet Kagame did not necessarily think that language is a perfect guide to philosophical conception. While admitting that Bantu peoples easily distinguish between time and space in their language, he argued that they have an underlying notion of spatio-temporal localization that belongs to each event we can experience. Thus, to say that something exists in these languages is to say that it is there. But time becomes meaningful only insofar as it belongs to our concrete lives. As Kagame puts it, time is a colorless, neutral entity as long as it is not marked or stamped by some specific event. It's worth noting that Kagame puts all this forward more as a philosopher than an anthropologist, albeit one whose proposals are grounded in and inspired by empirical findings. Like Mbiti before him, he gives the strong sense that he is not just attempting to describe a traditional African conception of time, but suggesting that this conception might just be the right one. Mbiti argued that the different experience of time in Africa had wide-ranging implications, He gave it a prominent place in his book on precisely these grounds, speaking of time as the key to our understanding of the basic religious and philosophical concepts that he ascribed to all traditional Africans. It may also be the aspect of Mbiti's thought that has attracted the most attention from other scholars. But the debate certainly did not end there. In this episode, we've seen how linguistic features, cultural practices, and proverbs could all inform philosophical reflection and perhaps provide evidence for underlying philosophical ideas in the cultures of Africa. We've also seen how skeptics responded to this approach. It's not time to draw conclusions yet, though, because we need to see how this method has been applied to other major philosophical issues. If you can think as far ahead as two weeks, then you can look forward to our next case study, African Conceptions of God and the Divine, here on The History of Africana Philosophy. (laughs) 